Okay, we're going to um, start. What I'm going to do is uh, uh, turn this over to Professor Phil Curry. Um, he is uh, an associate provost at MIT, and he is going to introduce uh, Minister Peters for us. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing Elizabeth Dupa Peters, the Energy Minister of South Africa. We are honored to have Minister Peters here today and look forward to hearing what she is doing to create opportunities for South African women involved in clean energy business and policy development. Minister Peters has been the Minister of Energy of the Republic of South Africa since May 2009. Her appointment to the position by President Jacob Zuma, followed a highly distinguished career in politics in the Northern Cape province of South Africa, where she served as the premier and governor until assuming national office. Minister Peters has also spent a lifetime of service to her community through her commitment to political activism, particularly in areas related to the advancement of women and young people. We are pleased that Minister Peters was able to spend time on the MIT campus yesterday where she was briefed about energy research at MIT and met with MIT President Raphael Reif. As most of you know, South Africa is one of nine countries that participate in the C3E program of the 23 country clean energy ministerial. C3E is designed to enhance opportunities for women in clean energy disciplines across the globe, and Minister Peters has been an active and passionate advocate for this program. She is also walking the talk in South Africa where under her leadership, South Africa's cabinet has approved an integrated electricity resource plan that proposes to double power generation capacity over the next 20 years, including a commitment to 15% renewables and 8% hydro. In the nearer term, South Africa will be adding 2,614 megawatts of solar energy to its grid by 2016 to help meet the energy needs of its growing economy. This will be supported by an investment of 100 billion rand. If I did my arithmetic this morning, that's about 12 billion US dollars. Minister Peters is also focusing on smaller scale renewables, facilitating the introduction of solar water heating, rooftop photovoltaic power generation, and landfill site gas development. Importantly, especially in a developing country, but instru instructive of our renewables industry in the US as well, Minister Peters expects 12,000 construction and 1,000 permanent jobs from South Africa's plans to stimulate a green energy economy. Minister Peters, while, settling, while setting South Africa on a path towards long-term, large-scale reliance on clean, renewable energy, recognizes the importance of conventional fuels to South Africa's near-term near future, including coal, gas, and nuclear. She is fully committed to utilizing these fuels in ways that minimize their environmental impacts and maximize their safe and efficient use. Please, let's welcome a strong supporter of C3E and its goals of advancing the role of women in clean energy, Elizabeth Dupua Peters, South Africa's Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Professor Philip Corey, for the wonderful introductions. Program Director, Madam Melanie, thank you very much for driving this program so efficiently. The Mayor of Cambridge, Madam Henrietta Davis, Ms. Susan Hockfield, President Emeritus of MIT, as well as the Zayat Future Energy Prize jurist. Professor Ernest Moniz, Director of MIT Energy Initi Initiative. And I, I would believe that Professor Rafael Raif will be here this afternoon, the President of MIT and the host of this important gathering. Secretary Barbara Cates Gannick, representing the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Christina Johnson, I'm very happy to see you, especially in view of the drive that you have put into C3. Ms. Hazel, Hazel Orhida Zikan from President Obama's office. 
I didn't see Sir David Sandalo, but I was informed that he's here, and I would want to acknowledge him also. All academics, researchers, innovators, and students who are here, in particular, the MIT Energy Initiative Management and Staff, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would believe that uh, in South Africa, we usually say all protocol observed, if you're not sure whether you covered everybody that needed to be <laughs> On a day like this in South Africa, we would have said Malibongwe Kamalamakoskas, which means let the name of the women be praised, because we believe that uh, women hold half of the sky up, and women need to be honored for their contribution. But we also believe that we are what we are in a democratic South Africa because of the impetus that was given to the struggle against apartheid by women. You would also remember that in South Africa we have a whole month dedicated to women, which is the month of August. We also have the day of 9th of August that is dedicated to women. And this clarion call of Malibongwe comes from those women, more than 20,000 of them, who marched on the union building in, the, in 1956, demanding the right not to carry passes. But in particular, these women were fighting for their men because the men were the ones that were, not, were carrying passes. So we want to draw today inspiration from that effort and that drive of those women. That is why in all sectors of our society, the clarion call is always Malibongo. Even if we speak about economic issues, even we speak about in the science fields, even when we speak about any other thing, we speak about Malibongo. But we also believe that it is important that the name of women be pressed. Because historically, even in biblical terms, there is an indication of the historic and the, 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 the revolutionary role played by women, that woman called Eve. Had she not done what she did, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to be part of this historic gathering to deliberate on how we have done and how we can do more in asserting the role and position of women in the clean energy sector. Thanks to DOE and MIT Energy Initiatives for this platform. The development of the clean energy sector marks a revolution in the energy sector, which will in the long run change, amongst others, the economics of energy, the dominant energy technologies for energy production, issues of transformation, the way we consume energy, as well as the form and structure of energy as we know it today. This energy revolution, ladies and gentlemen, has come at the right time for most of us from developing countries. Women are beginning to take active and decisive roles in the economy, as well as the social and political structures of our countries. I'm sure that we will all agree that Africa's future is looking brighter. Across the continent, there are market, marked signs of rapid growth and a positive trend of human development indicators. This is a sign that Africa is poised for change and that the 21st century is indeed Africa's century. Having reliable and affordable access to modern energy services is therefore a further crucial prerequisite to positively fostering this positive industrial trend. This bright future, ladies and gentlemen, can only be a reality if energy poverty is eradicated and the role of African energy decision makers, such as ministers, is to ensure that we support the development of energy on the continent and that we especially promote the deployment of cleaner, sustainable, and affordable energy carriers. It is an indictment for us in the African continent that the representation of women in the ministerial positions is actually a sprinkling. You, you would find that in that entire country, a continent of 54 countries, we've got less than 10 women who are in the energy sector. That includes those in, as women who are responsible for petroleum. So it is important that we actually grow this particular drive of making it possible that at a political decision-making level, we have women. We know that we cannot influence the president's decision. As we are sitting here, I'm holding my breath and my, 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 my thumb up for my colleague in Angola because you know Angola has just gone through an election and obviously there's going to be new appointments. The, women, the, the Minister of Energy was a woman and I'm wishing that uh, President uh, Dos Santos should retain her or alternatively appoint another woman. Otherwise, the 
number of women in energy will get, will get actually reduced. But also the number of women who now understand the drive that we have started engaging on in the continent as well as in the world. Because once you get into the position, you take a bit of time to understand. So once you have atlamatized, you would want to retain that type of experience. And that is what I'm wishing for and praying for that President Dos Santos should keep my colleague from Angola in her position. That is God willing. As leaders in the energy sector, various steps have been taken to ensure that in the decision-making processes, the fight to eradicate poverty is a top priority. Energy poverty is one of the debilitating factors which mit mit militates against the economic growth and development of communities and societies at large. Ladies and gentlemen, globally, about 1.5 billion people still don't have access to e electricity and around 2.5 billion people rely on traditional biomass as their primary source of energy. A clearly unsustainable position. It is widely accepted that, that this lack of access to affordable, reliable energy services is a fundamental hindrance to human, social, and economic development, and is a major impediment to achieving the Millennium Development Goals. The development of Africa's electrical power sector is a prerequisite for growth in other industries. Africa's power sector is dominated by South Africa is in Southern Africa, Egypt and Morocco in Northern Africa, and Nigeria in Western Africa. 82% of Africa's power comes from the Northern and Southern regions alone, with three quarters of existing supply coming from five countries, being Egypt, South Africa, Libya, Morocco, and Algeria. It is estimated that no more than 20% and in some countries, as little as 7% of the population has direct access to electricity. The proportion of people in Africa still without electricity is higher than in any other continent. The rate of urban electrification is lower than in any other continent. Out of about a billion people, less than 50% of the population is electrified. In some countries, the electrification rate is as low as 6%. Notably in Mozambique, Malawi, Benin, Burkina Faso, and the De Democratic Republic of the Congo, to mention just a few countries. This has severely crippled industrialization in Africa, and our growth and development, and indeed poverty eradication, in, will remain a dream as long as energy poverty is, is not solved. I, I just want to indicate that as South Africa was sitting at about 85% electrification, and we believe that we cannot have 85% electrification in South Africa, and other parts who happen to be our neighbors don't have electricity. There is a belief that people tend to follow where the lights uh, seem to be shining brightest. And we at times attribute this success to electrification, although we have not electrified the entire country, to the challenges that we have with the influx of people that we have from other parts of the continent. Because they believe that where the lights are shining brighter, there is life. And only to find that there is a massive number of people also still reeling in poverty. Out of the more than 25% that is still not electrified in South Africa. So when you see the number of informal settlements, you must also realize that it is the number of people who come from outside South Africa and who come from inside South Africa, from the rural areas, who want economic opportunities. We usually believe that we've got more economic migrants than any other situations. That's why usually in South Africa we say we don't have people looking for political asylum. It's people who are looking for economic opportunities. And that is why we've got this particular challenge. And you'd find that these uh, rural um, uh, areas as well as the informal settlements, because of the nature of the congestion there, or in the rural areas, the sparsely populated environment and the topography, it is difficult to electrify these areas. And there comes in the opportunity for off-grid technologies. And we believe that it is the route to go for now, whilst we are still looking at improving our infrastructure, especially for human settlements, but also in the rural areas to make it possible that we can bring uh, energy. So for us, the connectivity rate that we have, we have a, a decision and a target. Annually, we connect 150,000 households. Over and above that, we connect 10,000 to ho home solar systems. In the beginning, 
The people who were connected to the home solar systems were resisting the home solar systems, and they saw it as inferior technologies. Up until, I believe that it is more information, more knowledge, and seeing on TV the adverts about the alternative energy sources, but also the improvement on the type of technology. Because people were saying, if I cannot charge a cell phone, because as we speak, people are, are very poor, but you'd have 98% uh, mobile phone coverage. And they would say, if I cannot charge my cell phone, then it means it is not good enough. So we are also looking at the fact that people are saying, if I cannot watch TV, then it is not a good enough technology. So what we have done is to call on technology developers, but also sourced from other parts of the world, technology that is advanced that can allow them to f at least watch a color television. Because they were saying, you cannot even get a black and white television anywhere in the shops, but you want me to still watch a, a black and white television with this system that you are providing. So they would say, Minister, we'd rather wait for the day you will connect us to the grid than connect to those home solar systems. But now we are starting to see the, the, the uptake growing. In fact, people are actually coming forward to request that they be connected to, 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 the, to the system. So we're looking at making it possible that we grow the number of our people that have got access, but also make it possible that we build the infrastructure. I just want to indicate that as the energy sector in 2010, when we met in, 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 in in Washington for the C3 initiative. We, at that time, I was the Minister of Energy and we had uh, quite a few other people who were responsible for energy related matters. But I just want to say the influence and the drive for C3E has also resulted in a situation where they usually say, in terms of gender parity, the Department of Ge uh, Energy in South Africa has taken it overboard. We are sitting at about 52% of women in the Department of Energy. Every time my colleagues in energy go to present to cabinet, the, the, the cabinet members would say, here comes the energy girls. <laughs> so it shows that I'm, uh, let me start by indicating, you have a woman for a minister, deputy minister is a woman, the DG is a woman, and the CFO is a woman, the, the regulator, the CEO of the regulator is a woman. The chairman of the regulator is a woman. The Central Energy Fund is driven by women, including the acting CEO there being a woman. The National Oil Company is, a, is the CEO and president thereof is a woman. So we believe that it is important that we actually show that women have been kept back in the past, not because they are not capable, but because there was a belief that women have got other soft issues that they are considering that would not make them be able to survive in this tough energy environment. But it is those soft issues that actually makes it possible that women can survive in tough environments. Because you need to have that nurturing heart, that understanding. And that is why we can safely say today that integrated resource plan that we actually uh, 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 took through government in, including the fact that we could go and present five days after Fukushima a plan that included nuclear and let it still be adopted shows that the manner in which you present your issues makes it possible that you could then be able to get a hearing. We got a hearing in South Africa when the world was saying this is an indication that nuclear would not be considered. We believe that we had to justify nuclear in the interest of the issues that the lady there was raising about the coal uh, uh, sector mining jobs in particular, because we had a very, very volatile mining sector which said, if you're going to include coal, uh, nuclear and to displace coal, we are not going to support you. We had to look at how we bring in renewable energy, but also look at a clean energy source to buttress that, and we had to justify, and also look at the total value chain in the nuclear sector, and also the skills development potential and the upskilling of the people of South Africa, in particular in the continent, that will help us because of the high tech, the opportunity that we have. Now we have the young uh, nuclear professionals, we have women in nuclear in South, of South Africa also, a very active uh, uh, structure, and we also have women in oil and energy. So these are also processes that tells us that we need to work together. But we're also saying that 
As part of our plan, the integrated resource plan, we had to include coal because it would be wrong for us to say to the people of South Africa, we've got more than 40 billion tons of coal, but you old woman that is staying in the rural areas of KZN, you will have to live for the rest of your life just with solar. We are not going to touch the coal. The cabinet had to be convinced by us to say we are going to go out and get clean coal technologies. And guess what? The Minister of Science and Technology is a woman. And it is her responsibility to make sure that she works together with the Minister of Mineral Resources, who is also a woman, that we can make it possible that we get technologies that can make it possible that we produce clean coal if that exists. But wh what we know is that as South Africa, we are part of the Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum. We are also heavily involved in the investment with Norway in CCS, which is carbon capture and storage. We are also, through our own uh, utility company, ESCOM, investing in what we call underground coal gasification. So as to make it possible that the, the coal comes up as gas as opposed to bringing up that coal. And this is a debate that we have inculcated in our climate change processes. And I want to say to you, our climate change strategy in the country is driven by another woman. So it, is, it shows you that in the key decision-making platforms in South Africa, we have women. And President Zuma believes in the power of women because he says he wouldn't have been what he is had he not had the women who are his mother who actually drived his interest even when he went to jail and came out of jail. It was his mother who said, you can't abandon the struggle against apartheid. Till we are free, you are not going to be saying that we are free. So it means as a country, we have the responsibility to, 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 to make it possible that we, we grow, including the, the, the renewable energy I mean, input. In our integrated resource plan, we've got 42% of renewable energy. Half of it, solar PV, and at the time, we took this decision about solar PV informed by the challenges that we had as South Africa with regard to water. And, and we had a very minimal CSP in the plan, minimal to an extent where we gave almost 40% of the 42% is coal, I mean not coal, solar, PV, and 42, I mean 40% 40 is, 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 is wind, but 10% is CSP. But we are very excited now with technology advancement that there is indications that very soon there would be ability, in other countries it's already done, CSP with storage. And already we have been exposed to companies that are able to do CSP with storage for 24 hours. So it means the potential to grow the clean energy component in our uh, energy plan is even growing more and more. And we have an opportunity from people like you who have got information, well-researched indicators that shows us that it can be done. We want to work together with you. But we also want women of South Africa and the continent of Africa equally to be em empowered and capacitated. That brings me to the point of C3E because for us, C3E speaks to clean energy, education, and empowerment for women. How do we bring women to be able to make it possible that when we talk about alternative energy, when we talk about clean energy, women are equally part of it, so that we don't come 10 years, 20 years after and say we need transformation, we need to bring women in when we were part of the initial processes. So we are here with you today to say, how do we work together? I've been identified as the ambassador for clean energy for C3E in Africa. In the next meeting in October, we will be take, tabling because in South Africa, we have already launched our chapter and we want to broaden the chapter in the total uh, a broader African continent. We are taking it to the, uh, to the Conference of Energy Ministers of Africa for them to now know how it, it can work. And we believe that there are companies, like for example, I know many of you know Sasol. Sasol has taken this initiative with both hands. The scholarships that they are giving now are geared at making, meeting the targets as set by C3E to be able to say, how do we make it possible? And I know Christina would remember at the, in, in Washington when we launched, we had uh, the, the, the HR uh, uh, the executive of Sasol and she made the commitment which she's honoring today. And I just want to say to you, 
October, not October, August last year in, in Women's Month, when we launched the C3E chapter, which is driven in South Africa by the Deputy Minister of Energy. We had many of the cabinet ministers supporting the initiative, including those who are in health, to be able to say clean energy does improve health indicators for women in particular. And we spoke at length about the suitcase uh, the lady here is, 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 is having, because at the time she told us about that, that solar suitcase, it was still being a, a researched. But now I know that it's something that we could, we could support because it improves, in particular, the challenges that we have with traditional midwives who are working in the rural areas, who have got to help women uh, give birth in we, uh, during wee hours of, of, of the night. And these traditional midwives, we could empower them with this particular gadget so that when they go out in those rural areas of KZN, Eastern Cape and, and Limpopo, they could then be able to use this light to help them improve the outcome. Many women die not when they're supposed to be celebrating life. And we cannot celebrate when women die because of giving life. So I just want to say that for us as, as the continent of Africa, we believe there is opportunities. And, and, and we can share, because we as a, the South African government, we've got the cooperation agreement uh, 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 and an MOU with the DOE, Oh, DOE South Africa has got a cooperation agreement with DOE America to, for capacity building and technology exchange. And we believe that it is by sharing these information that we can be able to capacitate ourselves to understand what is available where. One of the areas that I heard you speak about, and I, I listened to the challenges that the panel spoke about, is the fact that we have been in, given a, a indicators that South Africa has got shale gas. And we're looking forward to... The, 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 the exploration and extraction of that shale gas as the energy department. Because for us, those as those who are having the mandate of security of supply, it is our responsibility to make sure that where there is potential for energy resources, we must go after it. But in an environmentally responsible and sustainable way. The issues of the chemicals and the issues of the, the water usage and also the challenges, especially for that area in the Karoo in South Africa. We are still engaging with it, and we believe that it's also just by engaging even those women who are part of those movements that says no to fracking. We would want to know why they say no to a resource that would make it possible that they have an alternative. So we're looking forward to working together with many, many, many women across the world and especially in view of the fact that we say we've got uh, the d different uh, instruments, including the fact that we're working now on uh, wind and o ocean current, but it is still not, uh, what I would say, proven. But we also believe that our ocean current turbines inside the ocean along the 2,000 kilometers long coastline from Morocco to Senegal could potentially generate all of Africa's energy needs. While wind turbine spacing of only 2.4 square kilometers on part of the 200, I mean 2,000 kilometers long coastline from Morocco to Senegal could potentially generate a production of more than 1,000 terawatt hours per year. So these are the information that we have that says we need funding, we need technology to be able to make it possible that this can happen. The potential of solar power is enormous in Africa. All of us know that. The solar resource is by far the single most abundant energy resource Africa has, and if harnessed, could meet all the electricity needs of Africa. Solar energy falling freely from the skies to reach everywhere on the continent without transmission lines can be utilized to provide off-grid electricity to remote communities far from national grids, Renewable energy and off-grid technologies in particular can go a long way in alleviating some of these challenges. We had a conference of energy ministers of Africa in 2010, where the first which, which indicated that we are the first to endorse the proposed declaration by the UN to declare 2012 this year as the year of universal energy access to clean and sustainable energy for all. This, ladies and gentlemen, demonstrate the willingness, decisiveness, and focus of African energy decision makers to ensure that the continent is rid of the energy poverty and takes the lead in the en clean energy revolution. Further to this, the AU heads of states and government has declared 2010 to 2020 as the decade of women. 
The aim of the African Women's Decade is to advance gender equality by accelerating implementation of the Dakar, Beijing, and AU Assembly decisions on gender equality and women's empowerment through dual top down and bottom up approach, which is inclusive of grassroots participation. Many of the issues that the AU has identified for 2010 to 2020 as the decade of women are related to what we're doing in the C3E. Education, especially, and in particular issues related to empowerment, and including bringing in women into the science and technology field. So I want to say to you today, we are very much encouraged as the delegation from South Africa to be invited to this important platform because we realize that the C3E initiative in South Africa will only be successful when we work together with C3E chapters in other parts of the world that are equally successful. So we're looking forward to working together with you, making it possible that we can do more to improve the lives of women because it is those women who are unable to get opportunities in the sector in, in energy that we are talking about. It is those women who don't have, have access as we speak that we are talking about. It is those women who spend the better part of their time going out into the fields to go and look for cow dung or to look for wood to come and make fire to prepare food for the family that we are about. Those women who don't have time to really focus on improving their education and improving their social uh, and economic circumstances that we are about. So it is important that when we think and, and innovate and create certain things, we must remember that we intend to improve the life of our sisters. But we also want to make it possible that they can get educated in these fields so that they can also drive the program. I'm happy to indicate to you today that we have now a group of women in South Africa who have a license to generate hydropower and they are running a seven megawatt uh, hydropower plant through an initiative that we supported as the Department of Energy, which is called the Women in Oil and Energy. And I believe that with the Renewable Energy IPP procurement process, we also want women to be the power generators of that integrated resource plan that we talk about. It is not going to happen if it is only men that is going to be doing it. The, the, the uh, DG of the Department of Energy knows quite well. Every time we speak, I say, we need to have individual business plans or plans that will indicate what is it that we have done that improved the lives of women. When I saw the presentation that was done by yourself when you gave that album, I thought, I'm going back to the department. Everybody must give me his, her album that shows the women that she is mentoring, but who are also her mentors, those who made her to be what she is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Peters. That was informative as well as incredibly inspirational. Uh, your talk puts the jurisdictional disputes between agencies and con congressional committees in their proper perspective. 